others will join along the way. But uh, Jaime, why don't you take us away? Thank you, uh, Liana. Welcome, everybody, to our first uh, webinar. Uh, Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is proudly presenting this uh, webinar today with the theme of legislation and loans overview for businesses. My name is Jaime Di Paolo. I'm the proud CEO of the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And I want you to know, everybody, we feel you. We want to help. And we're here to help, and we put together with the help of our just two great partners this great webinar is going to take you along the way, and maybe you give you some ideas, and and some uh, instructions on how to get access to capital and how to, you know, in, inject some capital in your business and and make sure you you succeed. Our goal at the chamber is to make sure every Latino business in the state of Illinois is is is, is armed with the necessary tools and uh, capital so, so they can succeed. So welcome everybody. And I'd like to thank uh, personally Omero Tristan and Enrique Lopez for, for taking the time to make this thing possible. Thank you guys. And with that, I'll, I'll leave the mic to our wonderful moderator, Liana Brown from the, from the team of the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so thank you, Liana, and please. Thank you, Jaime. I just wanna make a couple excuse me, housekeeping remarks, just so we're all on the same page. You are all on the webinar mode, so any of our attendees may notice that your, your sound and your video is turned off, and that's just so we all can uh, pay as much attention as we can to the actual presentation and panelists. For the Q&A for this session, the chat function is disabled because we, we ask you to use the Q&A feature for the webinar, and if you just bring your mouse to the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a bar with the Q&A feature. So you can submit your questions to our team mm -hmm. and you will be able to see your questions and the answers as they're responded to. So feel free to ask questions throughout. We will have a dedicated Q&A session for the last 15 minutes of the webinar to answer any, um, any additional questions. Uh, I do also want to note that if you prefer to answer questions in, or I'm sorry, if you prefer to ask questions in Spanish, our team is bilingual and can assist you and answer your questions in Spanish mm -hmm. as well. We'll also make the slides available to you after the presentation and can continue to address any, any questions. Um, and so with that, I will turn it over to Omero. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Omero Tristan and this is um, it, an interesting time, and I know that because of that, because of what's going on in the world generally, and because a lot of businesses, whether small or mid-sized, are feeling the impact, um, there's been a lot of interest in getting information. And I want to thank the Chamber and Jaime for um, deciding that part of its responsibility to its members was to continue to offer um, uh, information and be helpful. And I know that they're uh, continuing to serve as a resource or helping people fill out some of these applications for loans, et cetera, and so forth. So thank you to Jaime uh, and his team uh, for doing that. Uh, I know that we have uh, over 130 individuals that uh, signed up. And so you're all uh, tuning in. And I think that's just because of the, the number of questions that are out there. So with that, I'll get started with a presentation, which is going to cover uh, COVID-19 legislation and some of the loans and grants that are available for businesses. Uh, and I'm going to be leading this discussion today with uh, Enrique Lopez, who will give an introduction uh, on himself a little bit later in the presentation. So this is um, a little overview of what we're going to be doing. It'll be a brief uh, introduction, uh, which we're going through now. Uh, we're, we'll discuss the Family First Coronavirus Response Act the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act, the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Uh, then Enrique will give you some background on the Coronavirus Aid Relief and the Economic Security Act, the CARES Act, the Paycheck Protection Program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans and Loan Advance, other SBA loans and other programs that are um, currently in the marketplace and continuing to be designed, the State of Illinois Emergency Small Business Grants and Loan Assistance, the Chicago Small Business Resi Resiliency Loan Fund, and then we'll leave some time for questions. So 
planning on about uh, an hour for the presentation between uh, both Enrique and myself, maybe a little bit less, and then we wanted to leave ample time for questions. So feel free to uh, send those questions in uh, throughout the program. So a little bit about me. Uh, um, so I served as general counsel to the chamber. Um, I started the law firm of Tristan Cervantes uh, and we're an MBE firm here in the city. We're a member of the chamber, obviously. Uh, and my practice areas include labor, government affairs, and general corporate. Um, prior to that, I worked with the National Labor Relations Board. So I have a deep understanding of labor and employment laws and then worked with uh, a national firm doing the same thing. Uh, and then generally, I'm very active in um, legislative issues throughout the city. Uh, so are, I'm keen to keep an eye on some of the changes and some of the legislation that we see coming through. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the, um, what you'll be learning in this session is the, uh, what legislation the federal government has passed to uh, deal with the issues of COVID-19 the effect of that legislation on employers. Um, we've already gotten a slew of phone calls for guidance. Uh, and I can tell you that we're providing guidance based on what the Department of Labor is putting out there as well as, um, as, well as the government, whether it's OSHA or other agencies. But I can tell you that there is still a, uh, a host of questions that are gonna come up on the application of some of these rules. Uh, there are different federal, state, and city programs regarding loans, and so we'll talk a little bit about that and then some guidance generally on how to apply for some of those loan programs. So just to give you a little bit of background on some of the changes and how long we've been through this process, as we know, um, we've known about COVID for probably some time now. Um, and in Illinois specifically, it was um, uh, March 9th that the governor declared it a disaster area that allowed certain federal funding and emergency relief to immediately uh, uh, flow into the state. Um, on the 11th, the World Health Organization uh, characterized COVID as a pandemic. Um, on the 18th of March, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act was signed into law. And I can tell you that it probably took a week uh, or less. It was a quick response to everything going on. And so part of the reason a lot of information is out there and people are still going through it is that this um, this legislation was put on the books very quickly. And so a lot of legislators are still working through that um, and how to apply some of these rules. So, um, so we can understand why there's a lot of questions out there. Um, the 20th, our governor issued uh, in Illinois a stay at home order, uh, which is important because the stay at home order triggers some of the uh, applications of some of the rules that the um, uh, FFCRA put into place. And on March 27th, we see that the House of Representatives passed the largest economic bill and it was signed by the president. Uh, the CARES Act, uh, as it's come to be known, uh, was introduced into law. So um, the FFCRA, so the legislation follows the first emergency funding bill, which allocated about $8 billion for coronavirus prevention, preparation, and response. That first bill and that first funding bill was really designed more for uh, states and then general health organizations to uh, to do uh, to amplify some of the warnings and to be prepared for what they believed was coming. Uh, so it really didn't do much that would impact you as a business owner necessarily. Uh, a few weeks or soon thereafter, the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, responded to the growing health and economic crisis with provisions for paid sick leave, expanded unemployment benefits, insurance coverage of coronavirus testing and other nutrition and healthcare related assistance. And the act includes the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act and the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. Uh, and those are the ones that a lot of our clients and employers have been trying to sort through in terms of how to um, deal with employees, uh, whether it's working from home or uh, uh, or whether they're at home caring for a child or someone that is sick or they themselves have become sick. So who is covered? The FFCRA expanded the FMLA uh, or the Family Medical Leave Act to include all employers with fewer than 500 employees. Uh, so as you may know, typically FMLA uh, covers employers with 50 or more uh, employees and, for, and it covers employees who have worked at the company for 
uh, generally one year. So uh, this expanded who is covered by, um, uh, by FMLA protections. And we wanted to point out that there are exemptions for small business owners. So certain healthcare providers and emergency responders, responders are exempt from this expanded FMLA and paid sick leave provisions. You know, that just goes because, you know, for, for obvious reasons, uh, the healthcare workers are the front lines, making sure that they are addressing some of the healthcare issues. And small businesses with fewer than 50 employees are also exempt when doing so would jeopardize the viability of the business. Um, so when this rule was published, the Department of Labor did not necessarily provide guidance. They said that guidance would be forthcoming. They've since published some guidance. Um, and I can tell you that the guidance is pretty general. Um, and so if you are a business with 50 or less employees and you feel that um, providing this uh, FFCRA emergency leave or FMLA leave uh, is going to jeopardize your business, you're probably going to want to reach out to the chamber or to one of us to be able to provide that guidance. But generally, uh, you have to show that the that doing so would jeopardize the business and there's a few parameters that you have to pass through. So something to keep in mind is I know some of the members of the chamber uh, likely employ less than 50 employees and they're struggling with what to do as a result of, um, of that small business exemption. So as far as compliance and how you can um, comply with setting forth the rules, the Department of Labor is requiring employers to let Employees know that these protections are in place for them uh, for the family medical leave and the emergency paid leave. Um, so employers are required to post a notice in the workplace by April 1st, uh, and we provided a sample poster. Uh, you can also go to that website. You know, obviously, if your employees are not at the workplace and you're unable to post it, uh, the Department of Labor has given uh, guidance to say that you can either email it or direct mail it to your employees, or if you have a company intrasite or intraweb uh, or a website, if you post it on there for your employees um, on an electronic bulletin board, uh, you would comply with and satisfy the Department of Labor requirements. Okay, so the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act is um, the one that a lot of folks are uh, asking questions about. And so this allows for 10 days of paid sick leave, regardless of employee's tenure. If an employee is unable to work or telework for the six COVID-19 related reasons, and we'll go through those reasons um, th throughout the presentation here. So these are the six reasons uh, that have been published by the Department of Labor for guidance on the reasons for acceptable leave. So the employee is subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19. Uh, so in Illinois, that currently applies. The employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19. Uh, the employee is experience, experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 uh, and is seeking a medical diagnosis. Uh, reason four, the employee is caring for an individual who is uh, either subject to a federal state or local quarantine or isolation order related to COVID-19 um, or has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns related to COVID-19. Uh, reason five, the employee is caring for a son or daughter of uh, such an employee at the school um, uh, or place of uh, care of the son or daughter has been closed or the child care provider of such son or daughter is unavailable due to COVID-19 precautions. And then reason six, the employee is experiencing any other substantially similar conditions specified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, in consultation with the Secretary of the Treasury and Secretary of Labor. So six is just sort of vague, leaving it, uh, in my view, um, an opening to pr pronounce different sets of rules uh, as we move through this. And the reason that there are there are six and they're numbered and the specific reasons become important later on the type of leave the type of remuneration that an employer must provide to an employee so um, there's different reasons and different rates of pay that may apply for some of the leaves related to the reason for um, uh, your inability to work and we'll go through those so for the emergency paid sick leave 
Um, Full-time employees um, can are, are to be paid two weeks or up to 80 hours. Uh, and then part-time employees would be paid an amount equal to the number of hours that the employee works on average over a two-week period. Um, and as far as our compensation, it's really going to depend, as I said, on the different reasons that we outlined above. So um, if the leave is based on either reason one, two, or three, the compensation is at the regular rate of pay, and it's capped at $511 per day. Um, and then reasons four, five, and six um, are the employee would be paid at two-thirds of the regular rate of pay capped at $200 per day. So I'll go back and as you can see some of the reasons uh, that are outlined here. And so you can take a look at uh, one of the reasons why either an, for employers and their HR departments, it's going to be about when someone says that you're taking COVID related leave, you're going to want to document um, and put into their file the reason that they've outlined uh, for that leave because it becomes important later for the rate of pay. Um, and I can assure you that what is going to come of these particular rules and this leave is that there will be lawsuits related to the application or the misapplication of these rules. Uh, and those lawsuits, as much as employers will say, we were all in a crisis, we didn't know, we tried to do the right thing. Um, the statutes are pretty unforgiving, at least as they're written now. Uh, and so you will be subject to, unfortunately, having to defend those uh, and potentially have to pay. Uh, pay damages um, similar to traditional FMLA leave, which typically is unforgiving if it's applied incorrectly. Um, and I say that because there have already been lawsuits filed uh, in different jurisdictions based on not necessarily the application of FMLA leave as I just started, but uh, I can assure you that there will be a lot of legislation, a lot of litigation rather, as a result of this hurried legislation. Um, so you're, you, you, First of all, attending this, this particular webinar to learn a little bit about it is important, but making sure that you follow up and make sure that you're applying these rules in the right way. Um, so here are some of the uh, employer and employee restrictions. The employer cannot require the employees to use other paid leave before using the emergency paid sick leave. Employers cannot require the employee to find another employee to cover the hours during which the employee is using emergency paid sick leave. The employers may not discharge, discipline, or otherwise discriminate against any employee who takes paid sick leave under FFCRA and files a complaint or institutes a proceeding under FFCRA. Uh, you can't carry over uh, any of your COVID-19 paid sick leave and employees are not entitled to payment of unused COVID-19 paid sick leave upon termination from employment. Um, and then as far as payroll tax credits, and this is more uh, when you file your, uh, your taxes and working with your CPAs, uh, you're, you may be able to claim a credit of up to $511 per employee per day for any COVID-19 related FMLA leave that you do provide. Uh, and then this credit is capped at 10,000 for all calendar quarters per employee uh, for the reasons one to three. So again, working with um, your tax counselor to make sure that you've complied with or you're able to get some of those credits. So now we'll discuss the uh, Emergency Family and Medical Leave Expansion Act. And so the, this amount of leave is up to 12 weeks of job protected FMLA leave for employees who have been employed for at least 30 days. Um, so this is, um, providing somewhat of a restriction, uh, meaning that this protection only has to be provided for employees that have been at the workplace for 30 days. So it's gonna cover most, but, you know, but those that are your most recent hires, of course. And we'll kind of go through that. Um, and so then the, ex the acceptable reasons for the leave, and again, this is the expanded uh, beyond the two week period that we just talked about for the emergency paid sick leave. If the employee is unable to work or telework due to um, a need to care for a child under 18 years of age if the child's school or place of care has been closed or the child care provider of such child is unavailable due to a public health emergency. So in Illinois, that's currently the case. Schools are closed uh, for the immediate um, foreseen, unforeseeable future. So um, uh, it applies here in Illinois. And 
the compensation levels uh, for this type of leave um, in the first two weeks of such leave are unpaid. Again, and that's if, uh, in the rare case that the emergency leave doesn't apply. And then employees may use pre-existing personal vacation or sick leave during those first two weeks um, under the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. And then the remaining 10 weeks are paid uh, uh, are paid leave in an amount equal to two thirds of the employee's regular rate of pay for the remaining 10 weeks capped at $200 per day. So I know that we're gonna get a lot of questions on that, just the application of those rules are kind of, um, there's a bit of dissonance in how they're interpreted. But uh, again, I think what we're seeing is that we we're finding that there is a dis, I believe that there was a disconnect between the drafting of this uh, on the two different rules and how they would apply together. So uh, something to be mindful for. So essentially, um, most folks will probably invoke the emergency paid sick leave, but like FMLA, the employer, the employee has to avail themselves or give a, or, or inform the employee, employer um, with as much notice as possible that they're going to take a leave in order to trigger the different kinds of leave. So that still is an application of the rule. So. We'll go now to reinstatement. Um, and so reinstatement generally means with leave, there it's, FMLA generally discusses protected leave. And what that means is that the employee has gone away for the reasons that are being outlined. And, um, uh, and in doing so, the employer is keeping the job open for them. So when they're able to return. Again, we're in unchartered territory because uh, it's going to apply to a lot of different employees, and our economic uh, well-being is unforeseeable at the future, for the immediate future. And so, um, just to kind of go through what the rules and reinstatement are going to be, it's the same rules generally requiring reinstatement of employees taking leave under the FMLA would apply under FFCRA. Employers may be required to return employees to their same or equivalent position upon the return to work from such a leave, unless the employee's position ceases to exist due to an economic downturn or as a result of other circumstances caused by a public health emergency. So the, the last portion of public health emergency, you know, of course, is addressing um, the current state of the world with coronavirus. Um, and the economic downturn, I think that a lot of employers are going to be able to apply that as a reason for uh, not being able to um, keep those jobs uh, available for those employees. So we're gonna see a lot of questions related to reinstatement um, coming back. And again, I think you're gonna see a lot of litigation around that, whether or not the reinstatement uh, should have been granted or not. Currently there is litigation that uh, does occur under uh, traditional FMLA and whether or not reinstatement uh, or uh, an exemption to reinstatement based on economic reasons uh, is a valid reason. And I think we're going to see the same here. Um, and, and we'll see a lot of litigation when folks are able to go back to work. Um, and again, just a little bit about tax credit. So employers may be able to claim a credit of up to $200 um, per employee per day for any paid uh, leave. And again, there's a cap on that. And you're going to want to deal with or talk to um, folks like Enrique or your own CPAs. Uh, so that you get guidance on how you can um, avail yourself of some of those programs that are out there. Uh, they're important, frankly, because I think we're seeing that a lot of um, a lot of companies are, you know, initially uh, not, they may not feel the economic uh, downturn, but over time, you're going to see more and more companies, I think, realize that um, there are going to be some, uh, some losses related to uh, this particular um, this particular crisis that, uh, that we're all going through. Um, so I did want to touch on a few different things um, that we're seeing out there. I think that uh, a lot of folks are um, having questions related to, and we've seen questions come in from clients related to um, whether rules related to discrimination, um, harassment and a, a lot of those rules are going to continue to apply and in, in the application of some of these rules. So the same rules are going to apply as far as um, disciplining folks uh, and, and things of that nature. I know that um, we've gotten calls about uh, folks 
wanting to either discipline or terminate an employee as a result of um, their inability or failure to be able to work or telework uh, during this time period. And so um, we're advising clients, you know, obviously if your employee is doing something uh, where they're not performing their job duties and they don't have one of the valid reasons, for example, childcare or any of the other um, six reasons that are outlined, you can continue to um, treat your employees uh, as you normally would. However, always with more caution, as you know, um, things are gonna be viewed through the lens of um, this crisis and whether or not um, you were overly uh, harsh for an employee or didn't give, give enough, um, didn't give enough protection related to some of the legislation that has passed. But uh, I can assure you that uh, this isn't a time period for employers to say that, you know, the employees have, um, essentially they can uh, be derelict in what their responsibilities are. They still have to perform if that's what you're requiring them to do. Uh, and if you need them to do work, then you can certainly, uh, you can certainly do that. Uh, we've also gotten questions about whether you can require a medical note uh, if someone wants to take leave for symptoms, for example. And you know, we've advised our clients that you can still, under as you would under traditional FMLA, you can still uh, require employees to uh, to bring in notes. However, the practical application of that right now and asking employees to go to a doctor um, for uh, non-health emergencies is really cutting against what the World Health Organization and a lot of the healthcare experts are saying for folks to stay away from uh, medical centers. So um, we're asking clients to really think about how their pragmatic approach to that might um, be a disconnect with what they're gonna wanna do um, and to kind of work on a case-by-case -case basis on how, um, and how they're doing that. Uh, we've also received questions from employers who um, are in the grocery or food service industry um, and whether they can require employees. Um, so unless the employee has one of the, again, stated six reasons, uh, whether it's childcare, health, or symptoms, um, you know, the employees are refusing to go uh, simply because they don't necessarily want to have any risk in going to work. And it's not, and that's not one of the outlined reasons, right? So we're being asked whether or not that employee could be terminated because of refusing to work. And the rule generally is that um, if they don't have one of the six valid reasons, they don't have a protection and therefore they can be terminated. However, we're asking employers to really tread lightly on that because, um, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of, um, a lot of rules and the application of rules that are seen as too draconian for employers are probably not going to uh, ultimately fare well for you. Um, when folks are filing claims, um, because certainly under OSHA, an employee may have a claim that you didn't provide um, enough protections and therefore they avail themselves of that right to, uh, to stay away from work. Um, we've seen, as I said earlier in the, in the discussion, um, a lot of lawsuits that, are, uh, that have been filed. And so, uh, as I may have mentioned, uh, the two Walmart employees who uh, did succumb and pass away as a, re as a result of COVID related reasons have filed a lawsuit against Walmart. Um, and some of the claims that they're stating is that uh, they did in fact tell the employer that they weren't feeling well, that they had some symptoms. Um, and so this, and the employer uh, didn't grant them any kind of leave. Um, and then ultimately two, uh, those two individuals are, are claiming that the employer um, didn't provide them enough protections. Um, we're also seeing that um, other lawsuits have popped up related to employers not providing uh, PPE or gloves or different precautions uh, in the workplace. And so um, we're going to see those went through the, um, to the court systems. Um, interestingly enough, we're also seeing lawsuits based on price gouging, right, which is typically unrelated. So as a business, if you're providing the service related to whether it's uh, PPE or anything like that, um, there have been lawsuits against Amazon, for example, um, that is now charging, you know, there was an instance where I think they charged uh, close to $100 for a roll of toilet paper, uh, which seems to be a popular item uh, these days. I'm still not certain why, but someday we'll find out why, I suppose. Um, and when we, you know, 
do a postmortem on this, but um, you know, so certain rules related to price gouging um, and certain laws against it, uh, there's been lawsuits related to that. And you know, this is just the beginning. Um, I think you're gonna see a lot of litigation around this issue. Uh, you're gonna see a lot more, a lot more rules that are gonna be applied on this issue. Um, just yesterday, the Fed announced that they were gonna probably throw some more money into some of these loan programs for what's called Main Street, which is uh, for companies larger than 500. And I know Enrique is gonna talk more about the, um, he's gonna talk more about some of the, um, uh, the programs that are available to small businesses uh, like yourselves. But I know that uh, we're beginning to see um, a uh, the Congress and the and the federal government react and and look at how this the economic downturn of this is going to um, and begin to impact businesses. And I can tell you that um, you know you hear about this a lot about the disconnect between the federal government and then the states and whether the federal government is doing enough. And um, um, that is all playing out as far as whether there's enough respirators and medical information coming out, but it, it's really also beginning to visit um, certain rules. Uh, and, and a lot of states have different rules for the application of some of these, uh, whether it's leave or different things. And the federal government hasn't set forth, uh, for example, a stay at home order, a shelter in place order for the entire country, um, which is you know really gonna cause some disconnect for employers that have uh, a national workforce and how you're going to apply those different rules. And I think that you're going to see more and more uh, not only um, this disconnect between the federal and the state coordination related to some of the getting resources out, like, the, like as I said, healthcare and PPE related matters, but you're also beginning to see some of the disconnect on some of the uh, legal and legislative issues where you've got some states that are legislating more uh, related to coronavirus and COVID-19. And um, so as a as an employer or as a company, you have to be aware that um, there are new rules that are being um, put onto the books uh, more and more. Um, and um, I did see that there was um, a series of questions throughout the presentation that were put on the, um, on the chat board. And so they're being addressed, as we said, and then I've stopped sharing. You may have seen that the screen went dark and I've stopped sharing the presentation and um, Enrique is going to begin to share the presentation and go into the next phase uh, of this. So once we get that, um, I think we have that. We may have that up, right, Enrique? Yep. Okay. So so with that, um, I'm happy to address uh, questions later during the live question program. And then um, I know that one of my colleagues, um, uh, another attorney from my office, is also on, and he's answering questions. Uh, in real time as you're asking them. So uh, feel free to continue to ask questions even uh, throughout the presentation. And if you wanna ask the question live, mm. uh, we'll leave some time for that later. So so with that, um, I wanna thank you for giving me the time to uh, provide a little bit of the uh, framework and the landscape on what's happening in labor and employment law. As always, um, you know, all the same rules apply related to labor and employment. So. Uh, that includes FLSA, Fair Labor Standards, and some of those other things. If you have any questions that come up outside of that, uh, please feel free to direct them to the chamber, to myself, to Enrique, or to your own tax and legal counselors. Thank you. So with that, Enrique. Thanks a lot, Omero. Good afternoon, everybody. Again, uh, my name is Enrique Lopez, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to really uh, recognize the Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce for being proactive and, and, and once again, demonstrating uh, 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 how, how important uh, their constituency is to, to the chamber. So uh, it, it, thanks a lot for, for all the support that, uh, that I see uh, them, them providing. Uh, it really goes a long way these days, especially. Um, <clears throat> as as uh, Omar mentioned, I'm gonna talk about some, some of the tax aspects and, and, and financial uh, aid programs that uh, come along with all of this legislation. A lot of this is still very much subject to interpretation because the programs are so new and there's so much complexity in them. So uh, there's a, a, number of, 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 uh, a number of sources of guidance out there that have provided, in some cases, sort of 
conflicting uh, interpretations, but uh, in, in general, what, what we've done as, as, uh, as, as, as pr practitioners is uh, try to look to the, the main sources of, of, of where the guidance is coming from, which is the Small Business Administration. And uh, you have to understand that in many cases, as you're dealing with the different funding sources like the banks, then it, uh, you, might, uh, you might face uh, some, again, uh, differences in terms of how the rules are, are interpreted for, for, for this purpose. Uh, again, uh, I, I started uh, my practice uh, in 2004, just uh, to give you a little bit, little bit of background. And uh, my firm services clients in various, various sectors, uh, primarily those in the, in, the, in the service industries. And we also service a number of nonprofit organizations. Uh, we provide accounting and tax services. And uh, we uh, work mostly with closely held businesses. Uh, so very representative of, 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 of the um, IHCC's constituency. I want to start out with uh, talking about the CARES Act. And primarily what we're seeing is, is, is the most interest in, in the Paycheck Protection Program. It uh, definitely goes, uh, it's a quite expansive program that provides very, very generous and needed assistance to many businesses, but it's uh, primarily dedicated for businesses who have, or organizations who have uh, fewer than 500 employees. The, the loan that is available can be up to $10 million and uh, it can be entirely forgiven uh, if, if, if the recipient of the, of the loan meets certain conditions that have to do primarily with keeping people employed. And uh, some of the, uh, in terms of who is eligible, as I mentioned, uh, it is uh, businesses and, and, and a number of nonprofit organizations. And uh, <clears throat> the, 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 there is a distinction within nonprofit organizations in that uh, certain non-charitable uh, nonprofit organizations do not qualify. But uh, we'd obviously be happy to help you determine whether what your eligibility is based on uh, all of the parameters provided. Uh, another exception to the 500 or fewer rule is to certain industries. So for example, certain hotels or restaurant businesses uh, do have uh, some uh, latitude in terms of being able, being eligible, even though they might be at, uh, at the over 500 uh, employee requirement. Uh, so what is the payment paycheck protection program? Uh, and again, yes. I just want to pause you for one moment. If you would be able to put it in the slideshow mode so we can all see the full screen, that would be ah, helpful. Sure, sure, sure. Is that better? Yes, uh, just it, if you could advance to the, the right slide, we'll be good to go. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> in terms of the loan requirements, the uh, loan is, is again, as I mentioned before, the restrictions are, are, are quite, quite flexible, quite liberal in terms of uh, who would be eligible to apply for the loan. The loan is a non-recourse loan and does not require any personal guarantees. The loan also does not require collateral. And the applicant does not have to actually certify or demonstrate that they are uh, in, in need or, or, or that they are not able to obtain this credit elsewhere. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the <clears throat> loan can be up to $10 million and it's in general based on your average monthly payroll times two and a half. So basically it covers two and a half months of payroll uh, that, uh, and, and in order for that to be forgiven, we'll talk about that a little bit further down the slides, but uh, as long as you, you use the proceeds for primarily for payroll and for <clears throat> certain other uh, expenses of your business that have to do with uh, mortgage, interest, uh, rent, and utilities. So how do you apply? The Paycheck Protection Program is available through your lending institutions or any institutions that work with uh, SBA programs. On this slide, there's a link here that would direct you to uh, being able to find 
<clears throat> potential matches of, 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 of lenders who would be able to help you with, uh, with the loan application process. The, uh, in terms of how the application itself will be processed and when you would get a determination on the approval of the application and when, when the proceeds and would actually come to, to the business, that's gonna vary depending on the lending institution itself based on their structure and based on uh, how, how quickly they're, they're able to put the, the applications through. I understand the complex is, the, the process is quite complicated for, for, for lenders. And uh, on, that, on that note, I, I would add that, um, again, lenders have different requirements in, 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 when, they, when it comes to the specific documents that should be provided as part of the application. The application itself is a standard application. It's a, it's a document provided by the Small Business Administration, and uh, that doesn't vary by institution. But in terms of what supporting documentation a lender might require, that does vary quite a bit, but in, t in general, it's gonna be payroll records showing that uh, what type of payroll uh, expenses uh, you're, you're running. And uh, payroll tax returns are typically the uh, primary source for, for substantiating the uh, history of the payroll that uh, your business incurred. So in terms of the forgiveness component of the loan itself, uh, the uh, principal portion of the loan can be forgiven if uh, during the next eight week period after you receive the loan, you demonstrate that you use the loan primarily for payroll, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, pay, the interest on your mortgage, the rent and the utilities. Uh, however, there is a requirement that not more than 25% of the loan can be used for non-payroll costs. In other words, you should use at least 75% of the loan for payroll costs, and the other 25% can be used for the other piece uh, items that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you also have to keep in mind that uh, you, ha you have to maintain <clears throat> the same level of full-time employees in general that you had prior to receiving the loan. In other words, as I mentioned earlier, the purpose of the loan is primarily designed so that you're able to maintain the same level of employees that you had prior to suffering injury from, from, from COVID-19. So uh, it, it's, the, it's, it's the government's way of providing an incentive to businesses to not stop, to, to not stop paying their employees. And uh, with that in mind, the government has put these requirements into place so that uh, you're able to, or uh, you maintain the level of employment and, uh, as, as you had before. And, and, the, and another requirement is that you not reduce employees' payroll by more than 25% for any employee earning $100,000 or less a year on an annual basis. Uh, in terms of how, deter, how, how we determine whether you maintain the same level of employees, we look to an average period that uh, is counted from, 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 from last year, from 2019, uh, and, and compared to the eight week period after receiving the loan. The rules vary a little bit for businesses that are considered seasonal. So if your, your, your business uh, it grows within the, during a certain period of, of, of the year because it's cyclical of some sort, then there's special rules to determine uh, the, whether you maintain the same average number of employees. I would also add that full-time equivalent uh, the, the rule addresses full-time equivalent employees, not, not just necessarily full-time employees. So for example, if you have, uh, and, and the full-time equivalent of an employee is somebody working an average 30 hours a week. So if you, for example, uh, laid off a full-time employee, but then you rehired two employees who work an average of 15 hours a week, then those two make up a, a full-time employee equivalent. So it's not just necessarily a headcount measure. It's also just based on the component that makes up uh, a full uh, a full time equivalent employee. In terms of uh, how you determine what you're entitled to or how much you qualify as a loan, the primary uh, base figure I would call that the base loan amount. The primary base amount is, like I said, wages. Uh, and salary and wages, commissions, and, and things that are in general 
are normally understood as compensation, but they also include cash tips, uh, paid leave, and a number of items that are, are shown on the, on the, on the left-hand side here of, of, the, of the slide. Uh, but in addition to that, the, employ the employer may also add any retirement benefits that they provide for their employees. So if you have a matching, for example, of a 401k for your employees, you are able to add that as part of your base. And that amount is then determined to, uh, to calculate the amount of the loan that you would get. Uh, you're also allowed to, to add, as, as, as employers know, uh, an unemployment taxes paid to the state are part of compensation expense for this reason, or for this purpose. And they are also added to the base of salaries and wages to determine uh, how much of the loan you're gonna receive. There's tons of interest and questions out there for sole proprietors and independent contractors. Uh, and it, it, for purposes of determining their amount, it, uh, it is based on <clears throat> essentially their net profits from, from, from their business if, if they don't have any other employees. Uh, and the, the application process is a little bit different for self-employed individuals because again, they, they, they typically would not have payroll expenses or they would not include themselves in, 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 in their payroll um, uh, expenses. So the, the application process is, a little, is slightly different. And by the way, that application opened up <clears throat> at most banks uh, today, uh, a week after the application opened up for uh, businesses with employees, which was uh, last, last Friday. Uh, as, as part of the calculation, the base, as I mentioned, the base is what we use to determine uh, how much the business is able to borrow. Uh, so in addition to wages, uh, benefits, and uh, state unemployment taxes, the other thing to keep in mind is that you should not include wages for anybody earning over 100,000. So that doesn't mean that you entirely exclude that person if he or she earned more than 100,000, you just carve out the piece that is in excess of 100,000. So for example, if you have two employ a business with two employees, one making uh, earning 100,000 and the other one earning 150,000, for purposes of this, you would use a base of 200,000 and then you would use that as uh, to determine to determine your average. Uh, you also have to exclude uh, any wages for somebody who does not have as a principal place of business here uh, in the U.S. So if your business has an employee who does not live in the United States, then that salary must be excluded as well as part of the base. But otherwise, in my opinion, I, I think this is a, a, a very very generous, uh, very broad. Uh, a, a, a program that covers uh, all of the major uh, costs of, of, of being able to, to fund payroll. Um, next, I want to talk about, about the SBA uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. Uh, you might hear that commonly referred to, referred to as the IDLE program for, for its um, uh, initials. Uh, so the Economic Injury Disaster Program is a program administered directly by the SBA, and uh, that provides you a, a maximum loan amount of $2 million. Uh, in terms of who is eligible, uh, again, any businesses with few, few hundred or fewer employees and also uh, nonprofit organizations. Uh, you, 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 you must be, uh, this requirement is, is kind of goes without saying that you must be in a, in a, in a disaster area, which currently is um, all of the states in the union, as well as all the territories. So uh, <clears throat> uh, that, 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 uh, that's, that's obviously uh, an, easy, an easy requirement. And um, <clears throat> in terms of um, what is the criteria, in ter this, this is more of a traditional uh, loan application process in that your, your credit history is, is, is uh, evaluated as part of, the, of part of this loan. And uh, the, the, you have to demonstrate that uh, you have the ability to repay it. Uh, in terms of uh, how much you can borrow, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the maximum is, is $2 million. And the interest rates are going to be at 3.75% uh, for small businesses and 2.75% uh, for nonprofit organizations. 
and the terms of uh, are, are up to 30 years for uh, repaying the loan. Uh, there is collateral, again, for any loan over $25,000, you have to demonstrate that you have collateral, and uh, those would typically be whatever assets your uh, business, business has, and, and you would have to use that as collateral as part of the application process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you have to go directly to the SBA to apply for this, and on this slide, you'll see a link to the uh, SBA itself, and uh, you would uh, apply with, uh, with the SBA directly, and uh, there's some information here, and when you'll have a decision, again, lots of uncertainty in terms of uh, exactly how, how long it will take, but um, there's, the, the SBA has provided some guidance that it's, it's a two to three week approval process, and then the funding could come in about five days. Um, I want to add that uh, <clears throat> something that's very, very worth noting is that uh, the, the economic injury disaster loan, uh, I, I, I would advise you to uh, consider, it, consider it carefully if uh, you're also consider, considering the payroll protection program because these are mutually exclusive. So if you were to apply for the EIDL, for the disaster loan from the, directly from the SBA, that would effectively disqualify you to apply for the payroll protection program. And uh, we've worked with a number of clients in, in helping them decide what makes the most sense for them, uh, depending on the level of payroll that they have, depending on uh, what they expect in terms of, 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 of the foreseeable future, however uncertain that may be. Uh, but just be, I, I wanna caution everyone that uh, opting for the economic injury disaster loan disqualifies you for the payroll protection program. There is an exception out there for this, and, and, and we have to be very, very careful in analyzing this in that you are allowed to apply for the EIDL program as long as you don't use the funds for the same purpose. So that could be a very, very unique situation within your business where you use PPP funds for payroll, and then you use the idle loan for, for, for some other purpose. So again, I would, I, would, I would caution you and I would advise that you carefully consider uh, the, 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 uh, the benefits and downsides to each of them and uh, figure out uh, carefully what, uh, what makes the most sense. I wanna to touch a little bit on other CARES uh, provisions, three primarily. One is the employer payroll tax holiday. Uh, this allows you to defer the payment of your payroll taxes for a couple of years, basically. So if you were to stop paying payroll taxes now, then you would have to, then you have an opportunity to defer the payment of those taxes uh, to the next following year, the next, next couple of years. So 50% uh, must be paid by the end of 2021 and the other 50% must be paid by 2022. And you would, the process for, for doing this would be basically, uh, if you use a payroll provider, uh, payroll provider providers out there are, are, are enabling their, their, their clients uh, who they process payroll for to allow them to defer this tax. Another uh, note of caution here is that, is that if you opt for this program, it also disqualifies you for the payroll protection program. So again, uh, I, would, uh, I, I, I would be very, uh, diligent and, and, and determining whether this makes sense for you because it could be very costly from the standpoint of uh, disqualifying your, your business from the payroll protection program. And obviously the, the key benefit in the payroll protection program is the forgiveness component of, of your loan. So meaning that it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's effectively a grant, a grant for your business that uh, you would never have to repay as long as you meet those conditions of how do you, how do you, how to, how you use the uh, proceeds of the loan. The next item is the employee retention credit. Uh, employers can receive 50% of, of, of wages that they pay to employees. Uh, the base of that wage amount is $10,000. So if you have an employee who is earning $10,000 during a certain quarter, you can qualify for a 50% credit, meaning that you would receive $5,000 as a credit um, against that salary. Uh, if you uh, demonstrate that your business had to shut down by order of a government, uh, or if you demonstrate that you had a 50% decline in revenue. Uh, a couple of other stipulations that uh, you, you do not 
qualify for this if you have credits under the F, FCRA. And also, if you opt for this employee retention credit, be aware that this also disqualifies you for uh, your, your business from applying to the payroll protection program. So again, uh, a lot of uh, analysis are required to determine whether this makes sense for you. Uh, there could be a unique situation where the, uh, the employee retention credit uh, could make sense, make sense to you, make sense for your business and would be more beneficial than the payroll protection program. But I would uh, advise that uh, that analysis uh, be uh, thoroughly performed to, to make sure that uh, you are better off. Uh, again, we've uh, advised some, um, some of our clients and, and helped them and guided them with uh, determining what makes the most sense. And uh, again, you're, you're, you're dealing with, with some uncertainty, but uh, we have to go with sort of the, the best information that we have in terms of uh, what your business needs are gonna be over the next several months, which is uh, obviously quite, quite, quite uncertain. The last item that uh, I'd like to touch on on the CARES Act is the net operating losses. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with what a net operating loss, I'll uh, explain that uh, briefly and in general. But your, your net operating loss is uh, effectively when uh, your expenses are higher than your revenue for any given year. So uh, very, very simple, and, and it's based on your tax return filing. If uh, your expenses are 150000 and your revenue is 100,000, then you, you have a net operating loss of 50,000. Well, prior to the CARES Act, that net operating loss had to, could only be utilized. In other words, it could be an offset to future taxable income uh, and if you carried that net operating loss forward. So you did not have the ability to use that retroactively to other years. After CARES Act, CARES Act allows businesses who have incurred losses during 2018, 19, or 20 to actually carry it back to, uh, to a period of five years. And that could be uh, a, a nice influx of, of cash to your business because what the net operating loss is, does is that it creates an additional deduction to your business for years that you, for which you've already filed for. So it could mean that you, you would effectively receive uh, a tax refund for any uh, taxes attributed to the loss that you incurred, again, in, in, in uh, 18, 19, or 20. So you could go back a number of years, up to five years, and then any remaining net operating losses could be used on a carry forward basis so that uh, you could use, use it to offset uh, future profits from, from your business. I want to talk a little bit about other SBA, SBA uh, loan programs. Uh, there is an advance on the IDLE program uh, that a lot, from, from the time that you apply, you're able to, even before your application is fully approved, you're able to obtain up to $10,000 as a grant. And uh, this grant as, 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 uh, it would not have to be repaid because it is, as, as it's called, a grant. Uh, if you do apply for the payroll protection program, it would be a, a, a offset with any proceeds from the payroll protection program. I also want to talk a little bit about some debt relief that came through with this legislation. Uh, effectively, the SBA uh, will pay your businesses principal and interest on any uh, 7A loans that were were issued prior to September 27, 2019, or uh, on any loans that are, 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 have just been, been issued uh, uh, after, after the legislation was adopted. So um, effectively, the SBA is paying for, for, for uh, any, any loans that you, again, uh, uh, for a period of six months, I, I should add, and uh, they, they would be able to pay the principal and interest on, on, on those loans. Uh, finally, the uh, SBA also has some express bridge loans for up to $25,000, uh, and, and um, it, it, the, the, as the name says, it's supposed to be uh, a, a, an easy process uh, that you would uh, seek through the, through the SBA itself. Uh, the last couple of slides talk more of, uh, from, of other sources of funding that are not related to, the, are, are not coming from the federal government. These are uh, items from the state of Illinois. The hospital emergency grant program. Um, there's some uh, some 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 assistance from the DCEO. Uh, the <clears throat> Illinois Small Business Emergency Loan Fund. Uh, again, also uh, loan opportunities that uh, that you have uh, from from the state of Illinois. Uh, 
uh, and the Downstate Small Business Stabilization Program. Again, additional funding there. <clears throat> In the interest of time, we'll, 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 I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll let you go through the details on, on the slide. But again, we'll be happy to answer uh, any, any questions that uh, you may have uh, related to any of these programs. Uh, lastly, the city of Chicago has uh, the Chicago Small Business Resiliency Fund. Uh, that's a $100 million fund that the, that the city of Chicago created for helping businesses that are primarily located in Chicago. So again, this is uh, strictly for businesses that uh, are based out of Chicago. And uh, there are some requirements there, as, as you can see, for who is eligible. But essentially, if you've experienced a 25% drop in, in revenue, uh, you have fewer than 50 employees, and uh, the, the, the maximum loan amount is, is, uh, is $50,000. Uh, <clears throat> With that, uh, that concludes my, my presentation and uh, hopefully you're, you're not uh, feeling this way and, 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 uh, and, and, and uh, we, we were able to answer some of your questions, but uh, we also are providing your, our, our, our contact information and uh, I, I, I know uh, Ometo uh, talked about his uh, will, willingness to help out with this process as well and, 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 and I am as well. Feel free to email me, contact me by phone. Uh, email is probably the quickest, uh, quickest method for, for uh, being able to respond to you. Thank you, uh, Omero and Enrique. Um, we now have plenty of, times for, plenty of time for questions. I do know that this is a lot of content. Uh, we will make sure to follow up with anyone afterwards who still has remaining questions. Uh, but as we've all seen, there's information out there, but I think it's a, it's a matter of, of clarifying a lot of these points. One thing I wanted to, to ask you to maybe explain a little bit more, Enrique, because we had a couple of questions to this, was the fact that the, the EIDL um, and the SBA disaster loan disqualifies you for the PPP. Can you talk a little bit more about it? Um, and some folks said that now they recognize that maybe the PPP loan is the best option for them, but they've already submitted the other application. So if you have any advice for them and what they can do. That, that's a very good question. That's a great question. Uh, so the, on, on the first part of the question that asked uh, why it disqualifies you or how, how you can get around being disqualified if you apply for EIDL, uh, EIDL came about earlier than PPP. So I do, I do see how many businesses basically jumped on idle and, uh, and, and, and put the application forth without knowing that PPP was, was, was gonna be available. <clears throat> so there's a couple of things that, that could be done actually when, if you're in that situation. Uh, for starters, if your application was submitted but you haven't received the loan, then I would argue that you have not received EIDL and you could still qualify for PPP. Uh, if you do receive EIDL proceeds, the, uh, the, uh, the, you have, then you have two options. One is if you determine that you can use PPP for the payroll piece and you use the EIDL for something else. So for example, one thing that I could think of is that if you have a retailer or distributor or manufacturer and you use PPP for payroll, paying for your payroll, and you use IDLE for maintaining your levels of inventory, then you satisfy the requirements and IDLE does not disqualify you from going after PPP. The other scenario that I could think of is that PPP allows any recipients of IDLE assistance, of IDLE programs to refinance IDLE with PPP proceeds. So for example, if I am a business who applied for EIDL, received, let's say $300,000, and uh, now I, I realize that PPP is more beneficial for me, then I would still apply for PPP and then indicate at PPP that I am, that my intent is to refinance EIDL so that EIDL becomes paid off by the payroll protection program and then you're able to enjoy the forgiveness component of PPP uh, by effectively paying off your EIDL loan. So I, I, I see those two as, a, as very, very viable uh, ways of getting around uh, th th these requirements. And I just wanna 
uh, if I can make a point just about the loans uh, generally, what we've we've gotten questions related to the financial aspects of it, and we just want to remind a lot of uh, really warn employers that are taking these loans that while there is a forgiveness component, and as long as you comply, it will be forgiven. But um, we don't want individuals to take some of these loans and bring on a debt burden that they wouldn't otherwise be able to sustain even mm -hmm. in normal circumstance of their business because a lot of these SBA loans do have, um, they're, they're gonna go after folks that uh, are unable to pay them back. They won't be forgiving some of these programs uh, if you don't qualify. So just as a point of, of, of warning, um, we don't wanna see in six or nine months folks defaulting on some of these loans um, because as much as you may want to claim COVID and it was a, it, it was a dire time, that's not going to be um, a legitimate excuse for not paying some of those loans. So just be responsible in, uh, in, in some of these loan programs. It's not free money necessarily. Thank you both. So I'm going to go back to some of the, the questions that were deferred and then I'll, I'll return to the open questions. So this one um, is for you, Omero. Um, this is in reference to the emergency paid sick leave. They asked a customer of ours gets paid in cash and their employer said that this doesn't apply to them. This is a human rights issue, not a payroll distinction, correct? So um, I saw, I was reading through some of the questions that were coming through and uh, some of the answers that uh, my, both the chamber and the colleagues uh, have been answering now. There was a lot of questions there related to, um, well, if they're independent contractors or, you know, they're not employees or independent contractors or they're being paid in cash or what about employees that um, are not uh, able to legally work in the country, uh, so for undocumented folks. So a, a lot of those questions around that issue. So as to whether or not it applies because you're paying cash, the rules, and this is a the same type of rules that have always existed related to the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, if you're paying an employee in cash, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not responsible for that employee. So what you're doing as an employer is really putting yourself at risk because you're likely not paying for unemployment benefits. You're not paying for workers' comp. So you're trying to do a workaround as an employer. So essentially, mm. you're committing, um, you're committing um, not an unlawful act, but you're improperly uh, coding that particular employee because you're not trying to have them on the books for all these different reasons that you're trying to save money on social security and other things right now um if the employee is being paid in cash they do have a right and they'll be able to make claims uh, arguably what i see is that employees are going to be able to make uh, wage claims even if they're being paid in uh in cash because they're technically an employee so um whether it's a human rights issue or not is is really not um, Jermaine here, they're essentially an employee and they should be treated as such and they sh technically are entitled. Now, um, there was questions there about whether or not folks are undocumented. Now, if the employer knowingly is employing individuals that are unable to work, that's a different basket of issues that we have to talk about. So you as the employer, in my view, if they're working for you, then they're legally able to work for you, right? So that should really be the baseline of how you're operating. If now you're saying, well, no, 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 these are all, these 10 employees are undocumented, so I don't have to, they don't qualify, I don't have to pay them. You've, you're, that's not really a great thing you wanna tell the federal government when they're coming to say to you, why didn't you pay these folks, these paid sick leave? And I'm like, oh, it's because I was hiring undocumented workers. Because then you're gonna get a visit from a different kind of federal agency, um, and my fees go up much higher when you're in that situation. So, so be, avail yourself of those particular considerations. And then the other question was about, I saw a lot of questions about independent contractors. Well, it doesn't qualify, they're independent contractors. Again, if your employee is, if you classify them as independent contractors or 1099, you're probably misclassifying that employee, um, but it depends. So a lot of people wanna say, well, nope, 1099, you pay your own taxes, but they direct their work and they essentially treat them like an employee. Under the law, they're an employee, and they, again, will be able to avail themselves of certain rights um, that are afforded to employees. And so you should really look at, first of all, you probably had them classified incorrectly, just to begin, not even COVID-related. And now with COVID and COVID protections, 
um, they're going to be treated under the law as an employee, even if you misclassified them. So hopefully that addresses uh, the question that you had, as well as um, some of the other questions that were being um, put out there. I have another question for you, Omedo, uh, again about emergency paid sick leave. So what type of document can the employer ask for if the employee asks for the emergency sick leave? So if they're asking, um, it, it depends on the six reasons, right? So um, you can request the either a medical, like let's say for medical reasons, you can require them to provide you with that. However, um, the, the legislation and the rules haven't really put forth a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of information related to that. Uh, again, because although you can require a medical reason and a medical note, um, currently the CDC and the government is saying not to go to medical centers if it can be avoided. So if you get something from, there, there's a lot of telemedicine options now if you're able to get something, but um, uh, certainly we're not, the rule is you can require it. The application of the rule for us that we're giving as guidance is um, if an employee is saying that they're unable to work because of uh, a particular leave, then you have to take them at their word, unfortunately, is what you know. a lot of employers are saying like, well, they can just do a workaround. They can say they can't work or they can say they have symptoms. Um, yes, but this isn't something that's gonna be on the books for you know years. This is on the books now during a crisis and so are you going to have some of your employees who maybe will abuse that? Sure. Um, but there's not much more that you can do uh, related to that. This one I will direct to you again, but if you want to hop in afterward, and, uh, Enrique. Um, so they ask if workers filed for unemployment and they come back to work, should they terminate unemployment immediately? Um, yes. Yeah, so if they file for um, now is so it depends so the employer is um, uh, typically the employer is the one that um, for unemployment purposes doesn't have to do anything it's usually the employee so if that employee is returning to work they have a responsibility to report that to uh, their unemployment office and so um, you know they're unable to um, they're unable to do anything related to to that that's incumbent on the employee Certainly the employer can say, hey, make sure you're off unemployment now. But, you know, frankly, um, the, the employee should, sh knows or should know that they're not able to double dip, if you will. And then secondarily, there was a question related to unemployment. And if I bring the employee back uh, for PPP, can, you know, can, can they cancel out their unemployment, et cetera, and so forth. And again, I think Enrique could probably touch on that, but the rules for PPP are that the employee is actually working, not that they're receiving unemployment or that it's supplementing it. So there are two different things. There's either you're employed or you're not employed. Those are the two statuses. There's no in between or there's no, I'll get PPP money for part of their unemployment. So it's, it's two different statuses. So Enrique, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that as well. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, in terms of I, I, the unemployment question, I think, I think was addressed, uh, I have nothing else to add. But the time, I think this has a lot to do with the time period of bringing employees back. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the period that is measured is eight weeks after receiving the loan from PPP. And that may favor your business or not. So for example, if you're a restaurant and you're closed because you're required to be closed by, by, by a state decree, uh, for example, here in Illinois, well, then it may not make sense to start paying employees right away if they're not working. That's a tough question because then you need to sort of time when you would receive the proceeds so that when we return to some semblance of normalcy, you're able to bring back employees when your restaurant opens up. And that's a little bit of a tough way to, to, it's a little bit tough to navigate through that right now because there isn't a lot of guidance on how to best time that. Uh, the SBA has suggested that you might be able to work with your lender uh, who's going to actually advance you the, or, or provide you the proceeds and try to defer 
the receiving the receiving of, of, of the proceeds so that you time it. Uh, and otherwise, uh, you're required to, to, to have uh, the, 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 the funds utilized within that eight week period following the, the receiving of the funds. Yes. Sorry, I just okay. wanted to say. Go uh, ahead, please. On the on the issue of um, um, some of these questions and in, in, uh, restaurants, for example, and whether they come back, and some questions that I've gotten from some of the folks, especially a lot of my clients that are um, that have their human resources either hats on or professionals on the calls, it's like, well, you know. Um, there's discussion about like garnering goodwill for the employees and when they bring them back and, and different things. So a lot of what you do or paying employees more than maybe what's required under uh, the paid sick leave. And so a lot of those things that you do as sort of a good, as a goodwill gesture for employees to keep their loyalty and to support them and everything, those are all encouraged. Um, ultimately as a business owner, you have to make the decision on, um, whether the goodwill that you're trying to garner is going to be sustainable as a business, because you're going to ultimately, if you goodwill yourself out of business, um, it's not going to do yourself or any of the employees um, uh, any good. So you really need to take a hard look at how you're applying this. The rules were written in such a way that it's giving relief really on both ends for the employer. So avail yourself of it as well as um, the employee. Um, um, so that's something to keep in mind, but certainly the app draconian application of rules or just completely having disregard for employees under this time because it's, you know, it's your business, et cetera, and so forth. I mean, I think that there's still the human element of this that um, you need to, you know, make sense of. And I think that really common sense needs to continue. COVID does not impact your common sense, nor should it, right? And so... Um, there's a lot of folks that are saying, well, I'm not going to pay my rent or I'm not going to do this. Look, as a business owner, um, what you want to do is talk to your landlord, you know, begin to engage individuals. Everyone knows the soup that we're in. And so, um, whether you're going to stop making payments to your, um, cellular carrier or to your copier or to your vendors, I mean, those are the things that you should, you know, if you need to do that, that's understandable, but have a conversation with them uh, and let them know and work on a payment plan because common sense should dictate no one's getting free money, um, you know, and always pay your lawyers and your accountants. First. Your accountants, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Great comments from we, you both. We encourage that. <laughs> um, so Enrique, this question is for you. They just want clarification on the excludable payroll taxes. You listed both employees and employer, sorry, and employers federal taxes. So we also include the employees' federal taxes. I thought that we only excluded the employer and not the employees. That, that's correct. So the, another, another way of viewing that is by just taking the gross payroll amount for the employee, and that would leave off any employee withholdings uh, as part of the equation. So if you just simply go to your gross payroll figure, that will... Uh, so it's a workaround with having to, having to consider the, the, the payroll taxes. Uh, but to that, you would add the state unemployment taxes. So in terms of what state and local employee uh, taxes apply, uh, if you're in Illinois, then um, it's only just the state unemployment that would be added back to, to or added to the wages as part of the base. Uh, but only, uh, there's two pieces, there's a federal and a state unemployment tax. Again, only the state unemployment uh, would be added. As a side note, small nonprofit organizations are not required to pay state unemployment taxes, so that 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 is a NA for them. Got it. So let me see if this makes sense to you. I'm a little confused as to what they might have been referencing. So let's see how far we can get with this one. It says, how long should we take into account? How many months? Ninety five percent of my business is face to face at my wellness center. I've been offering lots of free assistance and need some income. So I wonder if this is kind of the, the period of time during which they measure the, their uh, uh, eligible costs. That's my interpretation. Yeah, I, I think it, sure. I think it's similar to, to trying to find the best timing for when to receive the proceeds. And uh, it's, it's a tough question because uh, 
there isn't there isn't that much guidance on how much discretion you have as a borrower in, in directing when you receive the proceeds. So for example, in that scenario, if 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 this business has employees and uh, they receive the payroll protection program loan and uh, they they should start paying those employees uh, within the next eight weeks that they satisfy the requirements for the forgiveness component. And uh, you know whether it makes sense to pay them while they're at home, uh, or, or ideally, obviously, like I said earlier, pay them once you open up your business again and 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 and, and pay them for actually performing services. Um, you know that that that's a tough tough situation. Uh, I I would encourage uh, that uh, business to look at what other programs might offer. If, uh, if, for example, the employer retention credit uh, might, might make sense, or if the, per the person is, uh, is a sole proprietor, then that, that aid could come in uh, very quickly and, and, and obviously very useful if the, if the business does not have any payroll because that entire uh, loan amount would be going to him or her as the owner of the business. There's, there, there's not much clarity also on how you determine that the portion will be forgiven for, for a sole proprietorship because you're not spending that money on payroll. So it, it's unclear as to how you would demonstrate that you've satisfied the forgiveness requirement if you're a sole proprietor, her, proprietor who doesn't pay him or, her, or herself a, uh, a salary. Uh, but I'm sure there's, there's more to come on that. Yeah, I saw that question as well, and I wasn't clear on um, you're unable to you're still you're unable to charge clients or whatever the case might be. So I think that um, you you still have to continue to run your business in a pragmatic way. And so if there's not income uh, or the in inability to generate income, then you have to make decisions um, really based on that. And I've also seen a lot of questions about hey, my bank is not being responsive, or hey, can I go to any bank? And so generally, and I know that's more a question of um, on the loan program, but um, you're, in my view, you're going to be better off using your uh, relationship with your existing bank, and hopefully you've established one, uh, because they are paying more attention to their existing clients. I know that I had uh, a much easier time with my bank because of the relationship to be able to, uh, to do certain things. So if you don't have a banking relationship, um, you know, it's not too late to you know, try to have one because it's good generally for business. Um, and so you can, but you can generally apply for these loans through any SBA lender. There's some of these emergency loans where you have to have a pre-existing uh, relationship with them. So uh, just a lot of different things. And yes, all banks are busy. Yes, all banks are not getting back to folks. Yes, all banks, um, you know, their portals are crashing or whatever the case might be. That's just the way of the world because um, you've got, thousands of applications going in. And same with, and I'll say that about some of the other loan programs that we talked about, the city's mm -hmm. application program, I believe received 7,000 applications in one day. And they, you know, thus far have been able to approve 10. So they don't have the staff for this. You know, none of these programs that are being started overnight have staff or the know-how or et cetera on these things. So you're gonna have to be patient. None of this money is coming fast. So you need to do something for your business. That might mean putting off some of your vendors and you know, just having a conversation with them because uh, you're not gonna hit send to the application and get the money the next day. Uh, if it were that easy, I think that um, you know, um, more folks would be doing it, but you have to just operate your business and operate for survival and operate for longevity because this thing is gonna last us for a while the impact on the economy is going to last us even longer than, you know, once the health crisis is over, uh, the economic downturn on this is going to be meaningful. The way that we consume, the way that we shop, the way that we do anything is going to be forever changed in my view. Um, but that's just my um, grim look of things, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to respect everyone's time. So we'll be closing in just a moment. I'd like to share a couple of thoughts, but first, um, Enrique and then Omero, can you just uh, let everyone know how you can support them moving forward if you have, if you're working one-on-one -on -one with individuals to go through this process and what resources you might offer? Sure, no, uh, from, from 
in my experience, the, the most common questions are that we're getting from our clients uh, is, uh, first of all, what is this payer protection program? Which one makes the most, which of these programs makes the most sense for my business? And uh, we are uh, providing guidance on, on, on their particular situation and helping them decide what might make the most sense for them. And uh, in addition to that, we're also uh, actually helping them with the application process itself from uh, filling out the application to helping them with the calculation of, of, of the loan amount and uh, helping them determine uh, what, what, what that exact amount is, is going to be and, and then helping uh, respond to, to banks when banks come back with uh, <clears throat> questions uh, from on, on the application itself. So and all the above we'd be able to help with or anything else that, uh, that has not, has not come up. Yes, thank you for the question. And equally, um, I want to thank everyone that participated as well as the, uh, the chamber uh, for putting this together. Our office remains open. Um, you know, uh, lawyers were deemed an essential business. So uh, we continue to be, um, uh, to be around and um, I'm either working from home or can, you know, obviously um, we're limiting office visits, but um, our staff in office, you know, we have eight attorneys. And so we're dealing with issues related to the, whether it's the lending aspects, the legal aspects of the uh, paid sick leave, but folks that are operating their businesses continue to operate their business. So there's still lawsuits and other issues that may come up for your business unrelated to COVID. Um, and so we're still there as support. We're routinely putting out um, information or newsletters that update folks on laws and trends. So uh, if you're not already uh, receiving our emails, you know, send me an email. Uh, it's on the program that you're, we're sending you and we'll put you on our list so you'll get information. Um, and then just know that there's going to be continuing legislation. Today there's going to be new laws that will be passed, um, whether it's at the city level or state level. Uh, just be as much in tune with it. Just be responsible. Um, if you are a restaurant or some kind of other uh, industry, join an association. It's always helpful. Being a member of the chamber is always going to be helpful because I know that the chamber is pushing out information. I know that they've shared some of my news, my newsletters um, and some of these things, and and hopefully we'll continue to do that. Um, and cualquier cosa también en español. Si gustan uh, hablar y consultarnos en español. Este Enrique, uh, como yo, y muchos de mis abogados en el despacho, los podemos entender en, uh, en español. Um, so, hopefully that answers your question. Perfect. And I'm turning my camera on just so you know I'm human. I'm, I'm here with you. Um, <laughs> I do want to share very briefly a couple points of guidance. But first, um, Gabby, from the team, if you would please just Add, I've turned on the chat feature, so if you could add the email addresses for Sylvia and Juan Carlos, they have been behind the scenes answering your questions and will be available to follow up with you after. I know there's still a lot of open questions. They've been a great resource on the team. Sony uh, Cortez from Tristana Cervantes has also been answering your questions, so thank you. Um, in terms of what the Chamber can do to support we're also available to answer questions, to provide guidance, because we know there's a lot of programs out there. There's a lot of change that has been happening with each of those programs. So you can reach out to the e email addresses that were just put into the chat. Um, you can also continue to call us. Our team is working actively and is here to support you. Um, again, speaking to the question of, um, you know, who should you approach, ultimately we've, we've been recommending that people go to their business bank first if you have a, an account or an open line of credit or a loan that's really the the fastest way you're going to get answers and be able to start the process for the ppp loan we do recognize that there's a long wait um, in some cases if your bank is not uh, an approved lender at this point or if you maybe don't have a, a banking relationship at this point we do want to let you know that the chamber is at the moment actively seeking a, a lending partner that will receive uh, applications for new customers, not just a, a current pool. So that's something we are actively thinking about working about working on. And lastly, if you have other questions about how you might change your business operations, rethink your model to, mm -hmm. to adapt in this time, we're also here and available for that. Um, so with that, I will close. Um, 
want to thank again uh, the IHCC team, my colleagues, but first and for foremost, Enrique and Omero. This just proves just how much um, expertise we have in our membership pool, and we're, we're grateful to you and grateful to the support you're providing to our, for, to our community. Thanks for the opportunity to participate. <clears throat> Thank you. So thank you all. With that, we will with that we will conclude the presentation and we will follow up with questions afterwards and the presentation. So we will see you all and wish you the best during this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.